Hi everybody, it's Sarah Cray with Let's Make Art and I teach watercolor a new tutorial every week and this week we're doing corn husk. Ah. Um, I know that the corn husk is just this green part. I know that. It's corn and a corn husk. But yeah. do you really want me to title that corn and corn husk? No. No. <laughs> we have Keenan here who's doing our video. He talks me throughout, asks questions. We get in discussions about food. I have a feeling that will happen, considering what we're painting. And we're going to do this project in five steps. So our very first step, we're going to do our first initial layer of yellow wash on our corn. Our second step, we're going to do our first initial layer of green wash on our husk. Our third step, we're going to go back in and put in our darker values on our corn. And then step four is the darker values on our husk. And then the last step is just doing detail lines. So kind of like us separating some of these kernels, doing some of these stringy texture lines on the husk. And that's it. Nice. We're using two paint brushes for this project, around six and around two. Um, this is our Let's Make Art Classic series. Um, they're great brushes. Um, we also carry Princeton Heritage series. Those are also great brushes. Also, there are many brands of paint brushes. So use what you have, okay? We are using three colors for this project. So our first color is Tahoe Blue. Our second color is Fuchsia. And our third color is Dandelion Yellow. And as you can see, we're gonna be doing a lot of color mixing, which is great. If you're a subscriber to our watercolor box for the month of October, this was one of the bonus items, which is this um, like floral paint tray, which actually is super helpful. I like the butcher tray for mixing, but sometimes the colors run into each other if you have puddles of color. So sometimes I utilize both. Mm -hmm. And that way my colors stay separated, but I still have this huge area to mix. I like that. So um, I'm going to utilize both of these palettes during the tutorial today. Of course, you're the artist. You can make whatever decisions work best for you. Uh, we have an outline with this project, so we're going to do our outline, and then we'll do our oath, and then we'll start painting. So you're going to want to tape your outline down to your paper, and that way it doesn't move as you're tracing. And then you're going to take your graphite paper and do dark, shinier side, face down. And graphite paper is reusable. As you can see, this fella is pretty old. It's ripped. It's really soft, but it gets better with age. And I. I, because it's so old, I no longer get these like cross edges sometimes. Oh. Like with the brand new piece of graphite paper, these folds will show up while I'm tracing. That Is kind of stuff. Is there a way to age it faster? Yes. Let me show you. Let's say this is a new sheet of graphite paper. Let's pretend. <laughs> it is actually. It looks pretty new. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that I want to do is one, um, I kind of want to soften the amount of graphite on here. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll take like a scratch piece of paper and just rub. And let me do this so you guys can see over the camera. Like this. So I'm trying to get rid of all of the excess. Also, I'll crinkle it up. It's completely worthless now. Throw it in the trash. <laughs> Start over. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> And then after you crinkle it up, you can uncrinkle it, and then you're going to want to flatten it. So I just don't want to get this all over my painting. That's why I keep going out of frame. So if I do that here, and then you can even use like a table edge to flatten. Um, you can do another rub on your paper, but those are a couple of tricks I do with new graphite paper. Well, first of all, now doesn't that look so old? It does. <laughs> and also, if you flatten it after you crinkle it really nice and smooth, um, and if you rub off all of that excess, your lines won't be as dark um, when you're tracing, and hopefully those folds won't show up on your paper. So, a little trick for you. Hope Let's fold it back in half and get those lines back. Let's get those back. <laughs> <laughs> Let me move everything back to where it is. Did that go through? Nope. Okay, cool. All right. So I got my old ratty piece of graphite paper. 
Can I say ratty? Sure. Okay. Ratty. And now I'm going to start tracing. Basically, whenever you make a mark, it's going to show up and be transferred. So I like to do a line, and then I check the darkness of it. Try and make your lines as light as possible because watercolor is transparent. I do mine a little bit darker just so you guys can see like through the camera what's going on. But at home, when it's just me, I try and do really light. And there are some of you, like graphite is not the only way to transfer an image. Um, some people use light boxes. You can use like a window. There's, there's various methods. But honestly, in my personal work, I use graphite paper. It's just, it's simple. Um, I feel like with light boxes, I can't get the same amount of detail um, of like information from the photo reference when I'm tracing. So that's why I, I go with graphite paper because the photo or outline is on top so I can see it very clearly. Mm. Where with the light box, you have to put your piece of paper over the reference and you lose information. But again, there's no wrong way. It really is whatever is more comfortable for you or like less stressful. Now there are some dash marks here that you guys can see. That's me just telling you that um, that's a value change. And don't think of those value changes as in like right at that line that value has to stop. Um, I want it to feel smooth. So especially when it comes to um, transition edges like these dotted lines, um, it's a suggestion of where a transition kind of should start to take place. And then sometimes I get lost on what I've outlined because, you know, black pen on black outline. But I always like to view these outlines as a guide, suggestions, like soft and nice suggestions, not law. I don't want you to treat this like a coloring book because coloring books have a tendency to feel chunky and we want things to feel smooth. Okay, and I'm just gonna lift it up and make sure I got everything. These lines didn't show up. I'm just gonna do them a little darker so you guys can see. That's better. Oh, and I forgot this one. Okay, now if you untape your outline and you notice that you forgot an uh, area, it's super difficult to try and like tape it back. Um, so just eyeball it. Okay, let's do our oath. If you can raise your right hand and repeat after me, I promise to be kind to myself. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my work. I promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have fun. And I promise to have fun. I love starting that way because sometimes we just gotta tell ourselves it's not about being better or the best. Comparison is the thief of joy. You know? I like that quote. Me too. All right, so we're starting with step one. We're going to put our initial yellow wash on our corn. So I have dandelion here. And you can pull either from here or like bring some onto your palette if you want. But I'm gonna be using pretty much just straight yellow for this. I'm gonna start at the bottom of my corn husk using my round six. And then I'm gonna use water to blend up. Now when I get to this area, the top left area on my husk, I'm actually not going to put any color there because that's the highlight on my corn husk. Okay, so I wanna leave that area white because I need white chunks. And when we go back in and put details in, I'll put yellow in there, but for generally, I'm just gonna leave that white. And then if you want to, at this point, if you wanna start doing like little, like chunks, like kernels a little bit, 
like sections, you can. Again, it's just, this is our first layer, so we're gonna paint on top of this, but it's never a bad idea to kind of start visualizing where you're gonna want things to go. Okay, and kind of introducing those value changes already. All right, we're gonna do the same thing on this bottom one. Again, leave this top left area mostly white. So I'm starting with just dandelion yellow at the bottom. And then just grabbing some water, hitting it on my paper towel if I picked up too much water. And blending out. And again, I'm gonna put in just, just some kernel chunks. Just a hint, just to remind myself that this is not a flat, smooth surface. This surface has lots of little bumps. Okay, that's step one. Nice. Now we're going to move on to step two. We're going to mix green. So I'm going to take some Tahoe blue and bring it out onto my butcher tray. And I'm going to bring some yellow out onto my butcher tray as well. And I'm going to mix. Now this is why I love mixing green most of the time. Because it gives me freedom to control the temperature of the green. If I want a really nice yellow green, I can mix that by having more yellow. If I want a really nice cool green that has strong blue tones, I have the power to do that. And honestly, I'm gonna utilize both during um, while painting our husks here. So, so this is our first in initial wash. Now, another tip that I wanna throw in there is because I, I want this to feel a little bit more realistic. Um, I'm gonna tone down my green because liquid watercolor paints, I love them. They're super vibrant, which is what I love about them. But um, sometimes they're like so vibrant that if I'm trying to paint something realistic, um, it kind of ruins that feel because of the amount of saturation and vibrancy. So to combat that, if like, let's say you're trying to mix a green and you're like, man, this green is like highlighter green. It's so vibrant. It's not reading as realistic. What do I do? I'm gonna grab a tiny, tiny bit of fuchsia and mix that into my green. And that's just gonna bring brown tones into my green. Tone it down, desaturate that green a little bit. Okay, and then I'm just going to start painting my husk. I am gonna leave a thin white line between my green husk and my corn at this moment um, because I know that my yellow is still wet and I don't want those to blend together. Now, this is our first of, like layer, so it's not a huge deal, but I put that down and I'm like, wow, that's reading like really yellow. So if you need, I just swooped in a little bit more blue into that mixture. Almost fluorescent. Yeah. Yeah, you see how like, I mean, these colors are vibrant. They do have a fluorescent feel to them a little bit, which again is kind of the reason why I love them. But sometimes it's nice just to know how to tone that down a little bit if that's not the look you're going for. So I'm just kind of going through and painting the different sections on my husk. Now again, I'm a fan of, even though all of these areas are like touching, I'm a fan of painting section by section instead of just doing an even wash across the entire thing because it's just getting our mind prepared for separating these different areas. And if you want to add more husk or take it away or anything, you can. This is your painting. They kind of remind me of like Medusa's hair a little bit. That's what I think of. They're alive and have a mind of their own. They're like, <laughs> Also, I just want to remind you guys that um, I paint fairly quickly. Um, you don't have to paint as fast as I do. And there's a little gear on the videos um, where you can actually speed up or slow down the tutorials. Also, there is a pause button. So um, maybe you wanna like paint an area first and then pause it. You can do either, whatever feels right for you, but just know that our voices 
sound really funky, yeah. either sped up or slowed down. The laughs could probably get a little old. <laughs> and <laughs> otherwise, we could, I mean, if you slow it down, we're just... <laughs> I wonder how that sounds slowed down. <laughs> or sped up. <laughs> That's good. Nailed it. Nailed it. Okay, we're still keeping on keeping on. Now, if you want to, because sometimes what I'll do, just because I like to like go for it, is like I know that, um, like, okay, this is a great example right here. This husk that I'm going to see a little bit of. I know that I'm gonna have a darker value at the top and a darker value at the bottom. So sometimes what I'll do is just like throw that in because when it's nice and wet, it just kind of moves and creates different texture, which I really love. So if I take my dark green while it's nice and wet and I just drop that in here and just kind of let that wet on wet play and do its thing, that's an option. So depending on what you're going for, if you want things to be really detailed and smooth transitions and like really like that, then let your layers dry and then build on top of it. If you kind of really like the feeling of loose um, layers and watercolor textures and blooms and really embracing that spirit of watercolor, um, you can do it while it's wet. And still go back in and do another layer on top if you want, but just a little hint, there's two different ways to approach it. There's probably even more than that. And not one is wrong. It really is just all about you and what you prefer. And I hit my mic, I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay, so that's an option that you can start kind of creating those darker values on this first wash if you want. You don't have to. I honestly do both. I like to like, I don't know, give myself the freedom. I've been told that's very freeing. <laughs> Being free is very freeing? Yes. That can't be right. <laughs> and then like here, there's a shadow back here, so I can drop that in there if I want. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Like already just dropping those in, this feels so much more dimensional than this side. Yes. It is funny. The power of value. Oh, there's one little guy I forgot. Sorry. Sorry, little guy. Okay. Okay, so that was step two. Now we're going to move on to step three. We're going to go back into our corn and um, start introducing some darker values. So I have my yellow. And I want to create darker values. Now with watercolor, we can create different values by the amount of water and paint used. Another way to create values is by hue or by color. Because value doesn't necessarily mean the color of something. It's the lightness and darkness of a color. But the hue is the actual color of something. And you can achieve different values by using one or the other or both. So I like to do both because I really like color. So I'm gonna mix kind of like an orange. Just gonna bring that up to make sure that they can see it. And using this orange, I'm gonna do a darker layer at the bottom and then kind of start introducing this really warm kind of golden color. Now, when I get to the top part after I put it in, I'm gonna start lifting my brush and paying attention to um, the chunks a little bit. So if you can see here, you know how corn has rows? Mm-hmm, corn so, rows. <laughs> yes. So I'm gonna kinda of like pay attention to that as I'm moving this golden color up and kinda of start sectioning off into rows a little bit. Again, not super detailed, but just mostly just lifting my brush. And then maybe there are some areas where I'm like, I'm like, okay, that's yellow, but I want it to be really yellow. I just feel like it needs to be stronger color. You can drop that in there. And this is what I really love to do is just dropping in 
and I'll, well, you'll see this more when we go back into our final layer on this, but like having little hints of like that more red, um, it's just cool, I think. Okay, again, I'm still kind of avoiding this top left. I'm gonna do the same thing on my second um, corn where it's coming out. And the reason why there's a darker value at the bottom here is because it's surrounded by husk and it's coming out of the husk. And the husk itself is one, a layer on top of the corn and um, casting a shadow on the corn as well as the corn itself is a three-dimensional form. Okay, so it's rounded. Um, so there's a light playing with that and then also the, the husk is surrounding it. So where it's emerging from where it's being surrounded, it would be a darker value because it's coming out. And then that's why the tip is highlighted because not only is the light hitting it, but it's free of the husk. Okay? and kind of playing with rows a little bit. But you just want to make sure that where it's really coming out of the bottom, that's where you're going to see your darkest value. So if you're painting your corn and you're playing with layers and your darkest value is here, you need to adjust your painting and go back and either lighten that or darken that because we want it to transition from dark to light. And um, for me, I'm looking at this, I'm like, this looks great, but I feel like there's a really strong line right here of where it switches from orange to yellow. Do you see that on camera? Mm -hmm. um, I can just lighten, I can lift. So I'm just taking a damp brush, lifting up some of this value a little bit so that yellow kind of goes more down. And now I don't feel like it's a really straight hard edge. There we go. Okay. That was step three. We're moving on to step four. And we're gonna do the same thing that we just did on our corn husks. On our corn, we're gonna do it on our husks. So mix your greens. I'm gonna mix a few to choose from. I'm gonna do a really blue green. I'm gonna do a yellow green. And I'm gonna mix like a really dark brown green by mixing all three colors. And you might have to, I kind of ruined my yellow a little bit by not cleaning my brush when I was pulling colors. So if you gotta get a fresh uh, little bit of yellow on your palette, no problem. And then maybe even pull from this a little bit and get a brown. So I have a few different greens going on. I feel like I need more of a true green. There we go. Okay. That's nice. There we go. Yellow, green, green, blue, green, brown, green, brown. What was that? <laughs> Do you want me to say them again? Yeah, say them again. Okay, so I have like yellow, green. I have a regular green, I have a blue green, I have a brown green, and I have brown. Okay, got it. Thank you. And you can mix those as you guys go. Um, I've noticed, that's usually how I do it, but I've noticed that when I'm teaching, it's really helpful if I have these mixed that I can refer to so you guys know what I'm pulling from. Um, so if you don't want to mix these now, you don't have to. And also, don't stress if you can't get the same like shades or tones or anything as I can. We're mixing these colors. Everybody is going to look different. That's the beauty of it. So don't stress. Okay. So I know that this stock right here, is that a stock? Husk? Leaf? Husk. Is the entire thing a husk and one section is? There's a stock and then there's a husk. So the stock is what it's on. Yes. So that's not a stock. This is a piece, there's a piece of husk that is coming up behind the corn, this guy right here. So this is gonna be a really dark value because not only is it coming up the same way out of something, it's behind our corn. And whenever we want something to be pushed back um, in space in a painting, we make it a darker value. Okay, so I'm gonna get this 
brown green and I'm going to put that right where it's coming out from the corn. And then I'm going to grab some of this blue as well because I just, I love throwing blues into my, I love throwing different colors into my green and really having that variation. And then I'm just going to kind of blend up. Now, a little hint for you guys, I have a lot of paint on this, okay? So much so that if I were to keep blending this up, it would actually turn into one color or one value. So when you're blending, you can blend the opposite way down and really force that paint to stay at the bottom where we kind of want to keep it. And then I'm going to introduce kind of more of that yellow green up here. And you can even use like almost black. Like if I were to mix more blue and fuchsia into my brown that I have down here, it would, it's going to make like a really dark gray or black. You can introduce that to here as well. Really creating that dark value. Okay? And we're going to do the same thing on the one right next to it. Because it's also behind, it's also coming out from this spot right here. So I have my dark value. And I'm going to blend out. And then I'm going to start introducing other colors. Blue, yellow. If the colors are getting too dark, blend the opposite way and force that color to stay down. But I love to just drop in, like I'm like, okay, this feels, I'm just gonna drop in some yellow. Like look how nice that looks. I love that green. Is that good? It's just. And maybe you wanna do more of a stronger blue drop in where you're like, no, this, this needs a blue hint right there. Do that, embrace it. Also, I dropped a little yellow on my paper. That's okay. That's a piece of corn flying away. <laughs> that is a kernel popping, because yes. it's so hot. Yes. Okay. Um, let's move to this front one right here. Now this one is going to stay kind of highlighted. Um, it's a lighter value because it's in front and it's the what's on front of the corn. So I don't want to make this dark because then that would be confusing. It would then be like, okay, is this in front of the corn or is this like behind, like what's going on here? Mm. I want to make sure it stays in front. So I'm going to keep it mostly this light green color, but it is still three dimensional. It's a form around the corn, which means the edge here is rounding away from our light source. So it needs to be a darker value. So I'm going to introduce a darker value to the right edge of this section of the husk. Maybe a little bit of green. And then I'll, I'll go back in during our last step and put in the like husk lines because corn husks are like really fibrous and hairy and they have really strong uh, lines in them. So I'll go back and put those in. I'm not going to put them in just yet. I'm just putting in this, sorry, I got distracted. I'm putting in just kind of the edge here to show that even though it's in front, it is still a form. It's still moving away from our light. So it needs to have a shadow on the edge here. Okay, now this guy, and you can switch up the values too. These two I kept really dark values because it's behind the corn also. This one is kind of more to the side of the corn, so I don't feel like the value would be as dark. So I'm gonna do more of a blue-green there. Kind of blend that out. I know on my reference I have a yellow-green, but it felt right to do blue. You guys can switch it up however you see fit. I think green blue is my favorite green. Yeah, it's so Other good. than that, I mean, I don't know, the green blue and then that dark green you have on there. Yeah. Right above it. I just love those two. We're, what we're really trying to do is separate this piece from this piece from this piece from this piece. So that's why I'm kind of playing with different colors and values, okay? Now, the interesting thing about this piece right here is that it folds. 
So it comes up and then it tucks underneath so we, we can see the front and the back. So when that happens, to communicate that, the top part is going to stay highlighted and then where it folds and where it turns, it's gonna be a darker value. So I'm switching to my two just because it's a small area and kind of right here where that folds because it would be casting a shadow on itself. You see that now it feels like it's folding over a little bit. I have been trying to figure out how to do that since I learned how to paint a tulip. Yeah, you just got to introduce a darker value right where it. It's just, it's just a tricky shape. It is. It is a tricky shape. But don't get too caught up on it. Just kind of go with it, you know? Okay. Okay, same thing. This, I want it to be a darker value, but not as dark as these two. I'm using my two still just because this is a pretty tiny area. Drop in some yellow there just for variation. Okay. And um, I did leave thin lines in between some of these husk sections. But like this, between these two, that's really thick that I feel like it almost feels like an outline or a distraction now. So I'm gonna go in and like thin that line up. There we go, that feels a little bit better. Now, again, I want my darkest value to be right at this point where it's coming out. So I'm gonna push some color down there if I need to do another layer to make sure that color stays dark or that value stays dark, you absolutely can. Okay, we're just gonna keep on keeping on. I'm right-handed, so I honestly probably should have started on the left and worked my way across so that my wrist isn't in my painting, but I didn't do that. So just be careful of your wrist. It's just a new kind of challenge. Yeah, sometimes I'll rest my arm on my palette since it's like an inch higher than my paper, so I have an armrest. Just don't knock over your palette, because I have done that. So again, just little shadows, little values. You can make this darker if you want, because it is coming out behind, but. Okay, now this guy here. Same thing on these kind of two as this one, which is it's in front and right next to this corn husk. So it's more gonna be a darker value like along the side here to show that it's turning away um, instead of like coming out from behind something. Okay. So I'm adding a little bit of value on this. And just a little note, um, our mics are acting a little bit wonky, so if I cut out, I'm really sorry. Um, we'll try and edit them so you can't tell, but if it does, no, we're working on it. We're sorry. Okay, so same thing. This is gonna have more like thin texture lines. I don't have to go crazy with detail right now. The interesting thing about what's happening up here, these two, is that this is on the side, they're next to each other. And this is in front in the bottom, but then at the top, it's behind this one. So I need to separate those two things. So actually on this little guy right here, there would be a shadow off of that one. So then that makes it feel like they merged and then they separated, and this one is behind and this one is in front. Do you see that? Yes. You'll split off. They'll split off. One just turned 18. He's trying to get out of the house. <laughs> the other one's getting ready to graduate. He just wants his freedom. He wants his freedom. That was good. Thank you. That's a good movie. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to introduce maybe a little bit of this brown a little bit to the top of that. 
And this one, again, we're introducing a different value, but not so dark. We just wanna show that they're separate um, enough, not one unit, but not go so crazy as to make them feel like they're super far apart. Okay. All right, we're still going on, going on. I'm gonna just add a layer and this this husk is doing the same thing this is one piece this piece and this piece but it's turning okay so similar to this not as drapey though so in order for me to kind of show that it's turning we have to darken this shadow or create a shadow from where it starts to turn so i'm gonna do a blue green mixture here right at that edge and then blend out. Okay. Now here, I already kind of put in my shadow on this one, which is nice. So now I know, I'm like, okay, that's already defined. Let's just kind of darken it a little bit more. But this is the beauty of I just want to show you guys, see how I got this really cool, soft, watery edge? Mm -hmm. That's because I put that shadow in while it was wet. Mm -hmm. So that's why I like to do both, because I get these really fun textures, um, while also able to get these kinds of textures as well. And I, I guess I'm just a fan of mixing it up, color variation, value variation, and texture variation. Do some kind of more yellow. Oh, I just realized that I painted the bottom of this corn. See how there's a bottom edge right here? I painted that green. Oh. What can I do? Well, it kind of looks normal. It does kind of look normal. I'm not going to worry about it. Is I've that okay? Seen corn like that. Yeah. If you're if you haven't painted that green yet, you can paint that yellow in. Or do you want? Know I wonder what would happen if I try to lighten it, because this is going to be a really dark yellow. So even though we already laid down green, I wonder if I can lift up some of this green and put that yellow back in. Let's try it. I'll try it so you don't have to try it, and then you can decide what you want to do, okay? Perfect. Okay. But I don't want to put the yellow in yet because it's too wet, so I'll come back to that. Okay, and then I have this guy. Um, I already kind of put in my dark values there. I'm just going to kind of darken it one more time, thin out these white spaces in between the husks. Okay. I really love this project. <laughs> I just love the colors of it. I love the layering. Oh, the color of the corn is getting me. I love that it's enough detail that it, you can tell what's going on, but not so painstakingly much that we're spending hours and hours on this project. Um, okay. So that was step four. And now we're closing in on our very last step, which is we're kind of just putting in those detail lines. If we need to do another layer of dark values, we can just kind of tightening things up, okay? So at this point, I'm going to want to um, finish off my corn. And what I'm going to do, I just want to test this. Okay, I wanted to make sure my water wasn't too green and dirty. So I'm going to just take a damp brush, lift up some of this yellow and then put a little bit of yellow. I'm lifting my brush, so I'm kind of painting kernel sections a little bit. And leaving a lot of white spaces in between because again, that light is hitting it. There's a glare. Um, it's, it's a light value. And I'm gonna do the same thing on this side. Okay, 
and then um, I'm going to go back into my corn and if I feel like I need to darken anything, now is the time to do it. So for me, I have like a thin white or a thin light yellow edge right here where my husk meets my corn and I want to fill that in. And my husk is pretty much dry around that, that I, I'm not too worried if that dark color hits the green. It's not gonna blend out because it's not super wet. And also if it does, sometimes those cool bleeds are just like cool. So I don't, I try not to get mad when that happens because I'm like, oh, what texture is that going to look like? As long as it doesn't distract from the fact that it's corn, which I don't think it would, <laughs> then, then I don't really uh, get too worked up. Okay. All right. So before I go to my two and start putting in some of these lines, I'm gonna do one more yellow run on some of these areas of corn. So again, I'm lifting up my brush. I'm not doing a smooth wash and I'm kind of just like painting. They're not individual kernels per se because these are pretty large kernels, but it's just kind of sections and rows a little bit. And then the upper right hand side actually is going to have a little bit of a shadow up here because again, the left side is where the light is hitting. The right side is turning away from that light. Oh yeah, that's looking good. Now let's say you put, I put in these spaces and yeah, they look okay, but they're kind of patterny and they might feel like polka dotty or something. So if that's happening to you, what I do is I just take a damp brush and blend them out just a little bit. So the shape is still kind of there, but not so apparent. Okay. Oh, that corn is looking delightful. So good. <laughs> I'm going to let that dry for a second. I'm going to do the same thing on the left-hand side, then we'll go back in and do the, the little lines. So I'm just kind of going in, making sure that like where this corn meets the husk, it's dark. Let's try putting in that yellow. Let's see what happens. Okay, that's not bad. I mean, really what you're losing here is like, for example, this is a dark value. Sorry, I just wanted to blend that up. This is a dark value right here, but you see how there's like just a little highlight of a light yellow right yeah. in there? We'll lose that because there's green underneath, not white paper. So that's why we can't get like a light yellow just hint um. because there was a green wash underneath because I painted that area green and lifted the color up. So that's, that's really the only issue with that. Which, that's not that bad. And it won't seem as vibrant as well because um, vibrancy from paints is really how transparent they can be. So if you put a layer in between the white paper and the transparent paint of paint, then that color on top won't be as vibrant. but I'm still making it look like corn. So that's cool. What if someone did this and did candy corn instead? <laughs> Just like a beautiful stock and then husk and then candy corn. That would be cool. It would be cool. So I'm introducing kind of like a reddish brown on some of these areas. Oh yeah, I kind of like that. I like that it's peaking. Okay. 
And again, your painting is gonna inform you of what you need to do. You don't have to follow exactly everything that I'm doing if you feel like your painting does not need it. Right side, I'm gonna bring some yellow in because again, the right side is turning away from our light source and it's a three-dimensional form. And do the same thing with like the chunks. Okay, now I'm gonna switch back to my first corn stalk and I'm gonna grab my round two and I'm gonna mix a reddish orangish. I just want a darker value so when I do some of these um, rows, you can see it. Now one thing I want to point out is I did not take my paintbrush and do even marks and a grid on top of this to communicate kernels. What that would do is it would actually ruin, I felt like ruin was aggressive, but that's the only word I could think of. All of this form that we created at this point already with different values, if I were to do a pattern across this that was totally even in value and patterning, it would flatten my corn, totally flatten it. So you can see I'm only doing little chunks here and there to give enough information that yes, these are kernels, they are dimensional, they stick out and they're rounded, but not so much as to lose the entire form that I created. Um, because I want you guys to start, if, if this is like a hobby that you're really interested in and you wanna like paint things realistically, pay attention to how light hits form and how much information you're actually seeing with your eyes instead of what your brain is telling you that you see. For us, because we've held corn, we know what corn is, our brain sees corn and goes, oh, I know that there's a million little kernels on there. The same way as when you see a tree. I know that there's a million little leaves on that tree. But what we're actually physically seeing with our eyes is all of those little pieces bunch up together. And we're really just seeing lights and shadows of these bunches. And so that's kind of what's going on here. I want to show the light and shadow of the bunches but I don't wanna draw every individual kernel because chances are that's not what our eye is actually seeing. Or there is a way, and these are photorealist painters like Chuck Close, if you've heard of him, he does photorealism, very, very detailed, beautiful work. You can paint, if you see a picture that shows every individual kernel, you can paint that, you just have to all of this form that we created in this one, you have to do that on every little kernel. Because, I mean, it's true, every little kernel is rounded. It just takes so much time, which is not, again, not bad. Me, I don't like spending five days on a picture of corn. That would stress me out. Okay, that's just not the way I paint. There's nothing wrong with it, it's just not my style. If that's your style, nothing wrong with it. You're amazing, you just gotta spend more time doing it. Okay, that was a lot of talking. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna kind of follow my outlines here. So I'm kind of both showing the rows a little bit and then also kind of where the kernels curve in on these rows. So that's why I have, they kind of look like birds, like birds in a distance, you know? Oh yeah. That's kind of the shape I'm going for here. And again, you can just do hints here and there. It doesn't have to be. But then also think of corn itself when you're doing this. And notice that when it gets to this tip, the kernels themselves tend to get smaller. So um, like your little V birds would be a little bit closer together up here than they would down here. You know what I mean? You know on the edge yeah. of corn how they're like yeah. little baby? Little lady. Itty bitty corn space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a throwback from Aladdin. Yes, it is. That's good. So I'm kind of putting in the rows. And, and this is truly, truly one of the reasons why I love watercolor. Let's say you put in a row and you don't like it. And you're like, oh, that line is too dark. I don't like it. Just take a damp brush and just kind of blend it out. 
and then now it's softened, you know? And you can like start over if you want it to be detailed. Or maybe you're like, actually I decided I don't want a super detailed line right there. I just kind of want a hint of a line. That's great. And blending out some of these edges anyway is again giving a little hint of the form of the kernels that are going on between these rows. I'm going to blend this out. I felt like it was too dark for that highlighted side and too much like the one next to it. I'm going to go a little bit darker down at the bottom because the values would match. And I'm missing some, I just want to do some like strong red in there. I feel like I'm missing that a little bit. So I'm going to mix a little bit of my fuchsia with yellow. That is a garbage truck. <laughs> yep. It's going to get louder. And again, I highly suggest taking a step away from your painting, coming back to it, making any further adjustments. Um, Cause when you're this close, it's hard to see like really what is going on. Okay. Oh, cool. Okay. I just want to blend this out just a little bit. Because sometimes we do too much and it doesn't need to be that much, you know? I'm guilty of it. All right, now I'm going to do the same thing on this side. Just kind of putting little there's there's not as much line detail on this left one as this the front one right here but again just kind of making little marks to hint at rows and where these kernels kind of like tuck into each other Okay, we're going to leave that alone for now and go back to our stock. And this, we're pretty much just doing like stringy lines on um, like specifically these front two. So I'm going to take green and just kind of follow the shape of this stock. And if you need practice on how to do thin lines, light pressure, um, pull with your shoulder instead of your wrist. And um, you can practice on a scrap paper before. We're just trying to show that there's a little bit of fiber on this. Again, don't go too crazy with detail, just hints.
And if you even want to like thin out the, t the tips of some of these little ch chunks of husk, I like to do that too. It's just a nice little, I don't know, I feel like really thin lines is a nice little finishing touch on some things. Maybe I'll actually, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make this husk longer and grab that yellow dot. I'm thin thinning out some of this white, white line between husks. Okay, I'm gonna do one, just, I really wanna darken. I feel like this chunk right here is all one value. You see that? Yep. So I'm gonna lift up some of this color right here. If I can. Same thing on this. It probably was just too much paint in a really wet area and it kind of just evened out, but no big deal. I'm gonna lift the top where it's transitioning to the lighter part of the husk. And then I'm going to do one more dark value and I'm gonna try and get like almost black. So I have all three colors mixed together right here with mostly blue. There we go. That feels much better to me. Oh my gosh, I didn't, I miss, I totally missed this little chunk of husk. <laughs> that's, He's just like, hey. Hey. That's why it's good to paint in sections instead of doing even washes because I didn't separate it from the husk next to it. But no big deal. Just go back in. Paint it. Okay, we did it, you guys. That is lovely. Isn't it cool? Yes. Now, um, I will point out, I did a lot of layers here of different washes, and they dried differently, which created some really cool textures. I really love that it did that. Um, if you don't love it, what you can do is take a damp brush, smooth it all out, let it dry, do details on top. For me, I feel like it's still doing its job of saying that there's corn and it created some really cool wet on wets. So I'm gonna leave it. If I wanna like just do a hint of a little bit of rose in between there, since I, I kind of blended that out the last thing I did, just a little hint here and there. I think that's good. And then I still get to keep all of this delicious texture. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this project. I had a lot of fun with this project. I love the colors. It just screams fall to me. So um, I can't wait to see what you guys came up with. If you're on Instagram, you can tag us at let's go make art or hashtag let's make art. You can find us on Facebook. We created a group just so you guys can share what you're making. It is a very large group, but that's okay. It's so much easier to do things together, especially if it's new and scary. So that's called Let's Make Art Watercolor. Join. When you're feeling ready, you can start sharing your work. Don't feel like it needs to be perfect before you start sharing it. 
We are not interested in perfection here. That perpetuates the idea that art is a skill that you're born with or you're not, and it's not true. And the only way to show people that it's not true is to openly talk about our experiences, our journey, our failures, our wins and our losses. Loses. Wins. Losses. And our losses. <laughs> <laughs> so um, don't be intimidated. Put yourself out there. You guys can do this. If you need any of these supplies, you can find this at letsmakeart.com. Thank you so much for painting with me, and I'll see you next week. Bye.